really excited to have this event to celebrate our historic mural. My name is Zach Wareham. I'm the museum director and really excited to introduce this artwork. And I love public art and the idea of putting a mural on this wall is <clears throat> was really exciting and it came from Mr. Dabolo who had driven through a town and saw a photo collage of historic murals in Heartland, Minnesota. And he did some research and he found the artist Steve Delich. So we had a meeting with Steve Delich last summer to see about the possibility of doing this project here in town. And Mr. Delich introduced us to the Southeastern Minnesota Arts Council and suggested that we might qualify for an Arts and Cultural Heritage Grant to bring public art to Cannon Falls and to share our history. The Historical Society's mission is to represent the <clears throat> preservation, learning, and sharing of our heritage and to inform young and old alike that history lives in us all. And with the grant writing uh, process and proposal, we shared this idea of public art in downtown Cannon Falls as being right in line with our mission. And just like our storyteller, Mrs. Millicent, the stories that you have today are important. And if you write them down or want to share them, you can bring them up to the museum and we'll archive them for the future. When I first started as the director two and a half years ago, I met uh, Mr. Ryan Foster, who's uh, the assistant down there and does great work. And I, I talked to him a little bit about the mills and this photo in particular. And I, I asked him uh, if he remembered the Fredrickson Dam. And he didn't, and I, I really came to realize how quickly, you know, history comes and goes and all of our stories fade away. Now, when I was growing up and a boy, it was a different bridge up there, but we used to like to jump off the bridge into the river. You wouldn't do that today because it's about one foot deep and it exposes the cascades. For many generations, no one in Cannon Falls saw the Cascades. They were covered with a, a dam, and there was a lake right downtown. In 1954, when they replaced one of the dams, Mr. Fredrickson uh, <clears throat> helped raise the funds for the project, and they named the lake after him. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about this picture and the history of the mill and a little bit about Cannon Falls. Now the border around the picture was inspired by the border of a high school graduation photo that we have in the museum schoolroom. And it was chosen by Ryan Foster. And it's almost completed. The picture itself is an old postcard. And the postcard was somewhat iconic for Cannon Falls, and it was recreated in the early 1990s when the <clears throat> book Roots and Wings was published, a uh, scrapbook of Cannon Falls history. So the inspiration for the public art came from our mission, came from one to share our history, and the photo we chose was this one of the dam and of the mill. There's no dam and there's no mill anymore. And when you drive by, you see this cannon. And sometimes people think that we're named after cannons. Um, there was one anecdote of uh, a band director trying to describe Cannon Falls to someone placing an order and uh, he was the person on the phone couldn't understand the word cannon, and he kept uh, not. So the band director said, cannon, boom, boom, falls. Well, 
<clears throat> Cannon Falls was once called Cannon River Falls. And it might have been called the Little Cannon River Falls because our namesake is from the Cascade here on the Little Cannon River. Now, if I travel back to 1860 and try and recreate the scene, what we would see is a waterfall kind of like that one, but about 20 feet further in the background. There was no bridge, and there was this beautiful four-story limestone building quarried from the hill up the road. The building was vacant. It was abandoned. The town only had 300 people in it. In fact, that summer in Cannon Falls, where the confluence of the two rivers was, 400 Native Americans camped. The future of the town was uncertain. A financial panic in 1857 led to all the people that came here in the 1850s and became wealthy in the land exchange and speculation game lost their fortunes. In 1860, Red Wing had a population of 1,100 people, and it was the only incorporated city in the county. In 1857, before the financial panic, Ken Falls had 1,200 people. In a period of two years, this little village went from Native American hunting ground to one of the biggest up-and-coming cities in a new state of Minnesota, well, the territory of Minnesota. So in 1853, if we follow back a little bit earlier, Red Wing just opened up to settlement and a lot of uh, talented and intelligent, hardworking people started traveling west following the frontier. And some of the territorial legislators uh, the Freeborns moved down to Red Wing and there were only a few families there and they started traveling around the, the county and exploring the different regions. One man by the name of Edway Stoughton spent the whole year just building little shanty huts in the woods throughout Goodhue County. But he didn't travel up the Cannon River and didn't find the little Cannon River Falls. William and Richard Freeborn did, father and son. And when they traveled the old Indian roads from Red Wing to this area, they heard the thunderous sound of the cascades dropping over 26 feet. The <clears throat> river itself changes every year, and it would have looked quite a bit different. But they had a dream right then. They saw a rainbow, and the father said to the son, Suppose we found our pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. They didn't know if this territory was open for settlement or if it belonged to the Dakota people. So they went home to Red Wing. One of them went to St. Paul and they started to look for investors to try and build a new city. And they were so excited because of the water power the big falls and the big Cannon River, which is now submerged under 60 feet of water, Lake Billsby. People jump into Lake Billsby off the cliffs, right where those big falls are submerged. The Cascades down where another mill was built in 1867, but primarily it was the Cascades and the Little Cannon River that caused the, uh, <clears throat> or that was the impetus for the, the vision of this community. In 1854, the Freeborns convinced this outdoorsman, Edway Stoughton, to come with them. And they told him that he had to stay alone by himself across the river and build a house and squat in it so that they could claim the property. And he did that. And it wasn't until later in the year that new people started coming. One of the first people to come after Ed Bay Stoughton was a lawyer. Why in the world would an educated person come to the middle of nowhere? 
And it was because the water power drew ambitious entrepreneurs and pioneers with the dream of building a mill city. And it didn't take them long. In 1855, people came in. There were maybe 50 to 100 people. And they joined together and created the Cannon Falls Manufacturing Company, which built the first dam on the Little Cannon so that they could operate a planing mill to turn timber into wood so they could start building homes and houses. The little uh, one-story house built by Edway Stoughton, they called it the uh, McGinnis Hotel. Poor Stoughton was passed over. Uh, James McGinnis was a squatter that came and stayed in his home, and then uh, they gave him the title. So in 1855, a mill went in. People came to town. A couple hotels went up. And Freeborn formed a, <clears throat> a new business, Freeborn, Morse, and Daniels, with the idea of building this fine stone mill, hoping that it would be a prosperous flour mill. I can't imagine the amount of work and the amount of labor it took to quarry all this limestone. We have, in the historical museum, one limestone block, two and a half feet thick, and it's so heavy, I don't dare lift it by myself. And yet they had no tractors, they had few horses, and they didn't even have all that many people. In 1856, it was almost completed, and in 1857, they got the roof put on, and the Great Depression came, and the company went bankrupt, and the people left Cannon Falls. The mill stood vacant for almost 10 years. It's fitting that we have a demonstration on carding wool because the uh, first person that could afford to move into this fine facility uh, opened up a carding mill. It wasn't turned into a flour mill until the 1870s. In 1867, down on the Big Cannon River, somebody built a huge four-story wooden, a wooden uh, flour mill and that very same year that they built it, it washed away in a flood. They built it again. The early residents and pioneers of Cannon Falls weren't intimidated by challenges. They weren't uh, distraught from natural disaster. Fires destroyed Cannon Falls in 1884 and 1887, and they rebuilt. And after that fire in 1887, and all these brick buildings went up, it created kind of a, a unifying downtown uh, district of similar architectural styles. And that's partially the reason why Cannon Falls is on the National Register as a historic downtown district. Pre-Civil War, Goodhue County produced 150,000 bushels of wheat annually. Back then, they processed wheat pretty much like they did in biblical times. They had to grind it with uh, hand grinders. They cut it with a sigh and cradle. And it was highly labor intensive. If people had a huge crop, they had to go to Northfield to get it milled. So, once we had our first flour mill in 1867, the industry started growing up more. By 1875, Goodhue County was producing 2,500,000 bushels of wheat annually. And this is before we even had a railway. The, both railroads came to Cannes Falls in the early 1880s. But in this heyday of uh, the milling industry in Cannon Falls, Goodhue County was the second largest exporter for its size of flour in the nation. And we might as well have been called the Mill City, except for Minneapolis took that name. Our water power was second only to Minneapolis's water power. And once the railroad came to town, disadvantageous shipping prices 
forced our milling industry to ship their flour to Minneapolis, much of which was repackaged under Minneapolis names. The photo that this image was <coughs> painted from was taken sometime between 1881 and 1914. We're really excited to have this event to celebrate our historic mural. My name is Zach Wareham. I'm the museum director and really excited to introduce this artwork. And I love public art. And the idea of putting a mural on this wall is <clears throat> was really exciting. And it came from Mr. Dabolo, who had driven through a town and saw a photo collage of historic murals in Heartland, Minnesota. And he did some research, and he found the artist Steve Delich. So we had a meeting with Steve Delich last summer to see about the possibility of doing this project here in town. And Mr. Delich introduced us to the Southeastern Minnesota Arts Council and suggested that we might qualify for an Arts and Cultural Heritage Grant to bring public art to Cannon Falls and to share our history. The Historical Society's mission is to represent the <clears throat> preservation, learning, and sharing of our heritage, and to inform young and old alike that history lives in us all. And with the grant writing uh, process and proposal, we shared this idea of public art in downtown Cannon Falls as being right in line with our mission. And just like our storyteller, Mrs. Millicent, the stories that you have today are important. And if you write them down or want to share them, you can bring them up to the museum and we'll archive them for the future. When I first started as the director two and a half years ago, I met uh, Mr. Ryan Foster, who's uh, the assistant down there and does great work. And I, I talked to him a little bit about the mills and this photo in particular. And I, I asked him uh, if he remembered the Fredrickson Dam. And he didn't. And I, I really came to realize how quickly, you know, history comes and goes and all of our stories fade away. Now, when I was growing up and a boy, it was a different bridge up there. But we used to like to jump off the bridge into the river. You wouldn't do that today because it's about one foot deep and it exposes the Cascades. For many generations, no one in Cannon Falls saw the Cascades. They were covered with a, a dam and there was a lake right downtown. In 1954, when they replaced one of the dams, Mr. Fredrickson, uh, <coughs> helped raise the funds for the project, and they named the lake after him. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about this picture and the history of the mill and a little bit about Cannon Falls. Now, the border around the picture was inspired by the border of a high school graduation photo that we have in the museum schoolroom. And that was chosen by Ryan Foster. And it's almost completed. The picture itself is an old postcard. And the postcard was somewhat iconic for Cannon Falls. And it was recreated in the early 1990s when the <clears throat> book Roots and Wings was published, a uh, scrapbook of Cannon Falls history. So the inspiration for the public art came from our mission, came from one to share our history. And the photo we chose was this one of the dam and of the mill. There's no dam and there's no mill anymore. And when you drive by, you see this cannon. And sometimes people think that we're named after 
cannons. Um, there was one anecdote of uh, a band director trying to describe Cannon Falls to someone placing an order, and uh, he was the person on the phone couldn't understand the word cannon, and he kept uh, not. So the band director said, "Cannon, boom, boom, falls." Well, <clears throat> Cannon Falls was once called Cannon River Falls, and it might have been called the Little Cannon River Falls because. Our namesake is from the Cascade here on the Little Cannon River. Now, if I travel back to 1860 and try and recreate the scene, what we would see is a waterfall kind of like that one, but about 20 feet further in the background. There was no bridge, and there was this beautiful four-story limestone building quarried from the hill up the road. The building was vacant. It was abandoned. The town only had 300 people in it. In fact, that summer in Cannon Falls, where the confluence of the two rivers was, 400 Native Americans camped. The future of the town was uncertain. A financial panic in 1857 led to all the people that came here in the 1850s and became wealthy in the land exchange and speculation game lost their fortunes. In 1860, Red Wing had a population of 1,100 people, and it was the only incorporated city in the county. In 1857, before the financial panic, Ken Falls had 1,200 people. In a period of two years, this little village went from Native American hunting ground to one of the biggest up-and-coming cities in a new state of Minnesota, well, the territory of Minnesota. So in 1853, if we follow back a little bit earlier, Red Wing just opened up to settlement, and a lot of... Uh, Talented and intelligent, hardworking people started traveling west, following the frontier. And some of the territorial legislators, uh, the Freeborns, moved down to Red Wing. And there were only a few families there. And they started traveling around the, the county and exploring the different regions. One man by the name of Edway Stoughton spent the whole year just building little shanty huts in the woods throughout Goodhue County. But he didn't travel up the Cannon River and didn't find the Little Cannon River Falls. William and Richard Freeborn did, father and son. And when they traveled the old Indian roads from Red Wing to this area, they heard the thunderous sound of the Cascades dropping over 26 feet. The <clears throat> river itself changes every year, and it would have looked quite a bit different. But they had a dream right then. They saw a rainbow, and the father said to the son, suppose we found our pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. They didn't know if this territory was open for settlement or if it belonged to the Dakota people. So they went home to Red Wing. One of them went to St. Paul, and they started to look for investors to try and build a new city. And they were so excited because of the water power. The big falls and the big Cannon River, which is now submerged under 60 feet of water, Lake Billsby. People jump into Lake Billsby off the cliffs, right where those big falls are submerged. The Cascades down where another mill was built in 1867, but primarily it was the Cascades and the Little Cannon River that caused the, uh, <clears throat> or that was the impetus for the division of this community. In 1854, the Freeborns convinced this outdoorsman, Edway Stoughton, to come with them, and they told him that he had to stay alone by himself 
across the river and build a house so, and squat in it so that they could claim the property. And he did that. And it wasn't until later in the year that new people started coming. One of the first people to come after Ed B. Stoughton was a lawyer. Why in the world would an educated person come to the middle of nowhere? It was because the water power drew ambitious entrepreneurs and pioneers with the dream of building a mill city. And it didn't take them long. In 1855, people came in. There were maybe 50 to 100 people. And they joined together and created the Cannon Falls Manufacturing Company, which built the first dam on the Little Cannon so that they could operate a planing mill to turn timber into wood so they could start building homes and houses. The little uh, one-story house built by Ed Bay Stoughton, they called it the uh, McGinnis Hotel. Poor Stoughton was passed over. Uh, James McGinnis was a squatter that came and stayed in his home, and then uh, they gave him the title. So in 1855, a mill went in. People came to town. A couple hotels went up. And Freeborn formed a, <clears throat> a new business, Freeborn, Morse, and Daniels, with the idea of building this fine stone mill, hoping that it would be a prosperous flour mill. I can't imagine the amount of work and the amount of labor it took to quarry all this limestone. We have, in the historical museum, one limestone block, two and a half feet thick, and it's so heavy, I don't dare lift it by myself. And yet they had no tractors, they had few horses, and they didn't even have all that many people. In 1856, it was almost completed. And in 1857, they got the roof put on, and the Great Depression came, and the company went bankrupt, and the people left Cannon Falls. The mill stood vacant for almost 10 years. It's fitting that we have a demonstration on carding wool because the uh, first person that could afford to move into this fine facility uh, opened up a carding mill. It wasn't turned into a flour mill until the 1870s. In 1867, down on the Big Cannon River, somebody built a huge four-story wooden, a wooden uh, flour mill and that very same year that they built it, it washed away in a flood. They built it again. The early residents and pioneers of Cannon Falls weren't intimidated by challenges. They weren't uh, distraught from natural disaster. Fires destroyed Cannon Falls in 1884 and 1887, and they rebuilt. And after that fire in 1887, and all these brick buildings went up, it created kind of a, a unifying downtown uh, district of similar architectural styles. And that's partially the reason why Cannon Falls is on the National Register as a historic downtown district. Pre-Civil War, Goodhue County produced 150,000 bushels of wheat annually. Back then, they processed wheat pretty much like they did in biblical times. They had to grind it with uh, hand grinders. They cut it with a sigh and cradle. And it was highly labor intensive. If people had a huge crop, they had to go to Northfield to get it milled. So, once we had our first flour mill in 1867, the industry started growing up more. By 1875, Goodhue County was producing 200, or 2,500,000 bushels of wheat annually. And this is before we even had a railway. The, both railroads came to Cannes Falls in the early 1880s. But in this heyday of uh, the milling industry in Cannon Falls, 
Goodhue County was the second largest exporter for its size of flour in the nation. And we might as well have been called the Mill City, except for Minneapolis took that name. Our water power was second only to Minneapolis's water power. And once the railroad came to town, disadvantageous shipping prices forced our milling industry to ship their flour to Minneapolis, much of which was repackaged under Minneapolis names. The photo that this image was <clears throat> painted from was taken sometime between 1881 and 1914. And I only know that because of the bridge. In 1874, the first bridge across Mill Street went up, and it was a wooden bridge. And not seven years later, they put up this steel bridge. That bridge lasted until 1915, when they put up a, a fine stone bridge. I think that was a stone bridge I used to jump off when I was a kid. I guess it's most likely that it's turn of the century because the dam used to be further up and the perspective of the photo would have been different and you would have seen distance between the mill and the waterfall. Well, in my lifetime, there have been dozens of damaging floods and the Fredrickson Mill was taken out not 15 years ago due to a damaging flood. And it seems year after year after year, we're up against natural disasters and flooding. I like to call it the mighty little cannon. I had a friend that grew up in Sogan, and one of the floods in the 90s completely destroyed his house, and now Sogan is a ghost town. We hope that this mural kind of uh, brings alive the interest in the history of Cannon Falls, helps bring interest into the historical society and helps grow our membership so that we can preserve our past, collect our present, and share our stories. Because they are, they're very interesting and they're a microcosm of the past, a microcosm of a, a larger story of immigrants that moved away from Europe because in the mid-19th century, the peasantry was still alive and well. And unless you were the oldest son of a wealthy landlord, you had no hope to run your own farm. People came here in droves from Europe, Sweden, Norway, Germany, Ireland, and they grew plenty of different crops. But in the early years, it was mostly wheat. Second to that, it was potatoes. After that, it was corn, Indian corn, and then barley and rye and flax. The last mill, flour mill in Ken Falls, closed down in the late 1940s. Our soil was depleted by the lack of uh, rotation of crops. But this fine mill, this historic structure, was just torn down earlier than that in the 1930s. And again, just as this mill stood vacant due to a depression in 1857, it was vacant due to the Great Depression. One of the many big floods that took out the dams and exposed our cascades destroyed the dam in the late 1920s. And there was a uh, period about eight years where there was just a, a destroyed dam and an empty vacant building and uh, a sad community looking to rebuild like the rest of the nation. As transient camps were set up around the United States and part of the good deal to or new deal to rebuild the nation public works projects were started all over. Community residents approached the National Parks Board about rebuilding the dam. And at that time, they weren't even so much interested in the milling industry. 
they were interested in creating the lake because everybody liked to ice skate in the winter. They liked to cut ice from the, the frozen pond in the winter. It was great for bass fishing. And they missed having their iconic dam. In 1936, at the museum, there's correspondence with the National Park Service that administrated the Works Progress Administration about this, this project. And it ended up that when they came to town, they decided to take down the dam, or take down the, the stone mill. But the stone, just like in the 1850s, when the pioneers moved here thinking, what a great natural resource, limestone for building, was a great resource in the 1930s. And they used it to build the retaining wall of John Birch Park and the Works Progress Administration, also built the band shell. And they rebuilt a dam and changed the, uh, the landscape forever. Less than 20 years later, that dam was destroyed by a flood, and Lake Fredrickson Dam was built. I'm not sure that we'll ever have another big dam here, but we're so happy that this mural and this photo can kind of bring alive this iconic uh, mill and history and picture of a, a boat and four people enjoying the afternoon in a public boat that was parked down in the pond. If anybody wants to purchase a postcard of the photo that inspired this mural, they're 25 cents. You can get them here today or anytime you want down at the museum. Thanks for coming, and we hope you enjoy our Stone Mill mural. Hi, I want to introduce to you Nancy Ellison from, what was it, Zembro Zembroda. Zembroda, Minnesota. And she was so generous to come here today and demonstrate to us how to spin yarn out of wool. Am I saying that the right way? Okay, I didn't practice this beforehand. But uh, Nancy's going to tell us a little, about, a little bit about herself. I'm Nancy Ellison from Zambroda. I have a farm with about 40 sheep. Some are gray, black, brown, and white, different colors for different colors of wool for spinning and so forth. I have a spinning and weaving studio in my barn. Things outgrew the house, and there's um, lots of spinning wheels around, sometimes as many as 50. And there's uh, several looms, quite large floor looms, some that Scandinavian immigrants brought over from the old country. I brought along today some, a basket of wool that's raw as it comes off the sheep, what it looks like after it's washed, and, and also carting, and uh, kids can try their hand at carting today. Often kids did the carting while mom or grandma did the spinning years ago. I often do natural colors with uh, dyed wool, but I prefer just the natural colors of my sheep. Uh, natural dyes you can dye with onion skins and walnut hulls and grape juice and all sorts of things. And uh, there's lots of possibilities with knitting, crocheting, weaving, all sorts of things you can do with yarn. Good afternoon. Um, yeah, it was a big process to, uh, to get to the f point of painting a mural, actually. There's this much work of just setting it up and lining up all the different uh, ducks and getting them in a row to even uh, get to this point. And so I showed up here in June and met the, uh, the crew that I was going to work with. I had a really uh, fine set of uh, high school students that that I met. There were five of them and then the teacher, Nicolette Hernke, and we had uh, Alex Trainer, Alexa Ocecki, Carter Shades, Ryan Foster, and Molly Tomford. And they were just uh, a spectacular crew. When you look at our future and, and life as it goes on and you see these types of young people and their abilities and their uh, personalities, you, you realize that the future is in good shape. Uh, this was a, a really great experience for me. I've never enjoyed painting murals so much. Murals are um, a great challenge both intellectually and physically. It's a little bit like doing artwork and uh, big wall rock climbing. Uh, you have a different scale and it's a, it's a physical uh, adventure as well as an intellectual one. So having uh, 
all these young minds and, and bodies around to help was really uh, magnificent. So we had the two mural sites to do, and this is the one that we started on, and the help would show up, and uh, I talked to Nicolette Hernke, the, the teacher and advisor that helped us so much, a, a little bit about each student and what they did. And so uh, we got the surface primed, and then I decided, well, I've got these extra hands. I want to do something a little exceptional. Let's make a frame around this that isn't just an ordinary little frame or a mat that I might do, uh, but let's do something that looks 3D and it was really uh, interesting. So. I sent Ryan, who works at the museum, the historical museum, and Molly to find a frame design for me. And so they went in and came back with three or four pictures on the iPhone. And we decided this one would be the most exciting. Of course, the most exciting was the most complicated, too. And so then um, I'd heard that Alexa was a very good detailed drawer. So we had Alexa uh, take and bl we blew up. The, the design for this, and she drew it and then made a template for us so that we could repeat the pattern. And so then uh, I saw that she drew quite well, and so I gave her a, an exacto and I said, cut it out. And it was cut out beautifully. You had to simplify it and do these, make the right shapes. And she had done that beautifully. And then we uh, started laying the uh, pattern on, and uh, I had Carter and Alex start painting it. And all of a sudden, they had simplified this design down into this beautiful graphic. And so I had my team, and each one of them had strengths, and they did just a, a fabulous job. And I really didn't mention that in the, uh, at the other mural site, just how good they were. So I, it, was, it really wasn't an oversight. I just didn't want their heads to get too big, <laughs> at least not any bigger than mine. And, and so it was really a, a great process. Then we went and drew up the other one in the school and transferred that to the building. We worked at both sites. I could let them work on different projects and processes, and we shared responsibilities. And uh, we've put most of these murals together. And they're not quite finished. There will be details, and you can see some things. They're big projects, and they, they take whatever they take. But uh, I think they substantially show what they're going to be and what the, uh, what the uh, whole process is about, too. And I think process is such an important part of it so that I, uh, I think that actually not having them done gives us the opportunity just to uh, see how these things are put together a little bit and, and that whole experience. And then there was also all the auxiliary help, but particularly Steve Davilo, a year and a half ago called me up and I'm working down in Blue Earth at a monument company that I engraved for. And uh, he stopped in and we started talking. He had seen one of my murals. So that process actually for putting these here in his dream started over a year and a half ago. And so there's all kinds of meetings and calls and visits to the city and talking about sites and people. The amount of work that Steve has done is really uh, quite remarkable, probably as much work as I've done on these pro projects, including my painting and he hasn't done the painting, so we know how much effort uh, it really takes to uh, put together a community event like this and a community projects, community artwork. So to Steve, I wanna give him the, the one hand clap because uh, he really has been great to work with, great fun. It, it's kind of like working with a fire hose though. I mean, he, he keeps at it all of the time, so he keeps you on your toes and keeps you moving. So it, it, uh, it's great to have people that have that kind of drive and motivation and sincerity behind it all. So it's been wonderful to be here. Kind of my favorite mural project of all. I like small towns with uh, streams running through them. I spend a lot of time in Lanesboro. My grandmother was from there. I have land down there. And so, so to come to Cannon Falls and the people here and the atmosphere here uh, has been just a real treat. Uh, it's been one of the really best experiences I've had in this whole type of a process. And so. Uh, we're just dedicating the murals to the community. This is your public art. You own it. It's uh, yours to enjoy and to hope to create and take these boring spaces like parking lots and turn them into places that have a meaning to them and are exciting to be at, that, that really create a sense of place and who we are and, and just something interesting to uh, look at. So uh, thank you very much for, for everything. It's been uh, a terrific experience and I look forward to coming back a couple, three, four days and 
putting the details on. I hope you all watch the progress and the finish. Thank you very much. I am Miss Millicent coming down in that canoe down the Cannon River. How old am I? I'm not telling. My mother said anyone who would tell her age and her weight would tell anything and cannot be trusted. So I am only going to tell you what's important. And what's important is that I left the old country I left my home and my relatives, and I left with hope in my heart and a dream, and I followed my dream. And when I left, my grandmother put a shawl around my shoulders and wished me goodbye. And my grandfather said, remember, when you get there, you go to church. God is good and God is good to you because you are going to get to go to the new country. Now, it was hard to get enough money to come to the, com to the new country, but there were people in Besa who wrote this letter and I had a brother who was there and he sent me the money for my passage. There were other people who went some of them got money because somebody wanted a wife. Some of them got money because they wanted someone to come and work off the package, and then they would have to work for a couple of years. Well, I just loved when I got to Ellis Island because there were people there in the same boat as I was. They were people who came from Ireland because there were no potatoes left to eat. And they came from Scandinavia because if you were the oldest son, you got the farm. If you were second in line or if you were a girl, you got what the little boy shot at. There was nothing there. And so you had to follow your dream to what the letter from Vesa said was the beautiful town of Vesa and the beautiful town in Minnesota, Minnesota, the land of 10,000 lakes. Well, it was wonderful coming on the boat up the Hudson River. When we got there, there was one old Swede who was in that boat who looked up and said, look at these beautiful tall buildings. Look at that sky. Look at those trees. How beautiful it is. If this is so beautiful, what can Vesa look like? As we came down the river, I thought, yeah, they told me it was a land of 10,000 lakes, but what they didn't tell me was, oh, oh, it's a land of 10 million mosquitoes. And I know that in 150 or 200 years, somebody will invent a repellent for mosquitoes that says, off. Oh, mosquitoes. Down we came and I heard the roar of the falls. Down the cannon, here are the falls, Cannon Falls. Isn't that a good name for a town? I think this is where I am going to be. And so I looked up and here was a mill and the mill was reaching clear to the sky. And I know that if it's a mill, there will be a community because all of the paths 
all of the roads come from the farm to bring the grain to the mill and all of the people will come here and then there will be a new community and that's the way the whole new land of America beautiful for spacious skies and amber waves of grain America the beautiful and all of those mills bringing the little communities oh hurry up 1885 because I know then there will be flour sacks and the material and I will get a new dress out of the sacks of the flour. Hurry up, 1885. Now think 15 years later. A thousand people have come this way since I came here first. And one day alone, there were 3,000 loads of grain. And one man, Jonas Hames from Yumpland, came up here with three big loads of grain. That's the most of anybody in the whole country at that time, three loads. And he went down to Red Wing and took those three loads of grain to the mill and he was paid in gold. Well, he put the gold in his pants pocket, and when he got back to Cannon Falls, and going back down to Yumpland, he stood up and his suspenders broke from all of the gold that was in his pants. And the gold rolled all over the streets, and people yelled and ran and helped him get back all his gold. Mm -hmm. Well, <coughs> I would like to have you know of all of the wonderful people that I met after 15 years that I met at the foot of the mill. First one that I met was the ice man. The ice man came to get all of the sawdust from the mill, could wrap all of the You guys know that it's 1885 and you don't have motorcycles? <laughs> okay, some of the interesting people that I met were Coopers. And finally, the Coopers had to leave because the Coopers were the ones that made the barrels to hold the flour. And when uh, they started putting flour in flour sacks, the Coopers had to move on. But the ice man had a little shack, and in the winter time he would cut pieces of ice out of the river, wrap them in sawdust, and put them in, and we would have ice all summer long. The other people that I met were the school teachers who had a one-room schoolhouse. This was the place where people came for the politicians came. This is where they won their seats in Congress because they met at the mill and spread their pop propaganda at the foot of the mill. And this is where people got religion because this is where the pastors came and found the people to, to go to church out such as we have today in a tent. The, when I came to the mill, with my grain, I would be stamped, and they would take my grain and grind it according to first come, first serve. Sometimes I had to wait three days before it would be my turn to get my uh, grain ground into flour. And I didn't mind it because every day at meal day was a picnic. We went swimming and we played horseshoe and we had all kinds of games, and that's where you, the ladies change, exchange recipes and the guys exchange news. That was where you learned everything that was going on in the world, was right there in the little 
uh, store that always went up right at the foot of the mill. And <coughs> one of the things that would happen were the poker fights because everybody wanted to play cards. And some of those fights got pretty awful. But the one fight that we talk about for years is a fight at White Rock. You know, in White Rock, there is this beautiful white stone 50 feet in the air. And it's a sacred place for the Native Americans, and they danced around it. But also, the people in White Rock built a little dance hall there at White Rock. And that's where the fight was, Oldie Hageman and Henry O'Neill. They were big guys. Oli Hageman was a Swede. Henry O'Neill was an Irishman. And Oli threw Henry in the creek. And Henry couldn't swim one stroke. So Oli had to jump in and save him. But because that fight went all over the place, the grandmothers and the mothers would never let their daughters go to dance at White Rock. And I never got to go there. Never once, not one dance at White Rock did I get to. But the poker fights were the big ones. And when there was a poker fight, there was one fellow who ran three miles to go get Grandpa Hedin, because Grandpa Hedin was the biggest guy in the county. And Grandpa Hedin ran down, and he would break up the poker fights. And there are people that bear that Hedin name still in Cannon Falls. One thing about my flower, when it came out from my grain, five pounds of my flower was worth 14 cents. And the little girl that I took shopping, her little strawberries that she picked, a pint of strawberries, was worth two cents. With her two cents, she could go in the store and buy for one cent a piece of licorice and for one cent a piece of taffy. A whiskey, if I had a whole bushel of corn, um, I'd get 16 dollars for my corn for the whiskey but I didn't get that much if you brought your corn in for whiskey the government took four dollars and the railroad took a dollar and the manufacturer took a couple dollars and somebody else took some more money and a farmer got 40 cents and the guy that drank the whiskey got the headache Now, I have to tell you what else co things cost in that store when I took that little girl shopping. Butter was 35 cents. Eggs, 21 cents a dozen. Milk, 13 cents for a half a gallon. Potatoes, 19 cents for a peck. Coffee, 28 cents for a pound. Sugar, 34 cents for five pounds, salt, eight cents for three pounds, 20 cents for a quart of oil, beef was 15 cents a pound, and bacon was 12 cents a pound, and men's shoes were $1.75. Pants were a dollar and a quarter. So Jonas Haynes could go in and buy a pair of bib overalls could keep his money in his pocket. I needed a candle, it cost me a dollar and 22 cents. And my coffee pot cost me 50 cents. And yard goods was 10 cents. But what I wanted was the sack from the flower. Because three of the flower sacks could make a skirt, four of the flower sacks could make a whole dress, and of course, I wanted the best colors. They had some that were just beautiful colors. And of course, I dream in color, don't you?
That's my sacred story. Now, you all have a sacred story. And if you don't write down your story, it will be lost. And I would like to hear what your hope and your dream is. And I'd like you to write it down. I'd like you to take a trip in a canoe down the Cannon River. Then tell me what you see. Do you see the ruins of a mill? Tell me what you taste. Do you taste the same Slim Jim dried meat like I took with me on the boat? Do you hear the roar of the falls? Do you touch your nice material, which isn't nearly as rough as mine, and then you can smell the river. And we haven't been very good to the river. We have polluted it. Now let's clean that up and do it a lot better. And now tonight, go home and write. Write your story, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Anita Dabolo, and I've been asked to talk about some of the um, heirlooms in my family. <clears throat> this is the trunk that my great-grandparents brought from Sweden when they came over, and um, it says 1861, that was when my great-grandfather would have made it, and um, on the bottom, you can't really see it, but it says Christine Johnson, New York. That was where it was going from, uh, from Sweden. And, and Christine was my great-grandmother. They also, when they came over, um, brought their own bread and cheese. And this was the trunk that they packed for their family to bring bread and cheese, a smaller replica. And that one says 1865 on it. And then this is the accordion that my grandfather played Swedish songs on. And um, my grandfather played it, and my grandfather taught my dad the Swedish songs, and my dad taught me the Swedish songs. And my dad also taught my daughter the Swedish songs. So uh, we can play those Swedish songs. It just doesn't hold air very well right now, so it's hard to play. But it. It's an old-fashioned accordion that makes a different note if you go in or out, so it's much more difficult to play. This image is inspired from a panoramic photo at the Historical Museum. And the photo was brought to my attention on its uniqueness a couple years ago. On the 4th of July, a gentleman from Minneapolis came down and was shocked. He, he's a collector of panoramic threshing crew photos. And he had never seen a crew with nine teams of horses. We're really excited that, courtesy of uh, Mr. Bauer and the Log Cabin Village, that we have the same tractor here on display that's in the mural and a big threshing machine and an old car. My guess is it might be a Buick. I, I haven't been able to place it for sure. It, it doesn't look like any of the uh, 1910s Fords that I've seen. But what we see is a panoramic shot with lots of farmers and lots of work going on. The field was an exciting place during harvest season. And I've learned that even just today, having people share with me their experiences on threshing crews. This morning when I sat up, a lady walked by and was telling me about threshing crews in Wisconsin in 1935. A group of people from the Pancake Breakfast came by and told us about threshing crews. And it was a big, big deal. Huge teams of people working together, farming each other's fields, and for breakfast and lunch and dinner, big meals carried out to the farmers of 
potatoes and ham. Really, the farming and wheat industry is what helped Cannon Falls kind of explode on the map. And Goodhue County was once known as the, the Garden of Minnesota. In the 1850s, the land had never been plowed. And when the people first came here, the soil was so hard they had to break it with an ax. And boy, were they pleased to see how well everything grew. By 1855, the county produced 150,000 bushels of wheat in a year, some 40,000 bushels of potatoes, lots of corn, and plenty of other crops. A lot of it was sustenance farming. By 1880, Goodhue County had become the second largest exporter of flour in the nation for its size. It produced nearly 2,500,000 bushels of corn. And the mills in Cannon Falls employed 600 people, including the Oxford Mill. And before 1880, we didn't have the trains coming to and from. So the wheat was shipped by the river in barrels. Each mill employed a dozen some coopers to make their own bill barrels. Now this, this image is from the, uh, as best as I can guess, the nine, somewhere between 1915-1920. The tractor was made between 1911 and 1916, and the car, in the actual image, you can kind of date it by the uh, kerosene lamp headlights. When they built Lake Billsby Dam in 1911, there were tons of vehicles in the photo, and they didn't have kerosene lamp headlights. They had uh, more modern inventions. The threshing machine was an invention from the 18th century in Scotland. It would uh, <clears throat> rotate and beat the berries off of the, uh, when it was wheat, off the, the wheat and separate it from the, the chaff. And modern day combines really use the same process, except for the, the combines also reap the harvest. I watched a video today on some organic farmer who's using a old fashioned scythe and cradle to farm his wheat. And the theory he has is that uh, when you cut it down you, with this method, that the berries are, are preserved uh, and aren't damaged so much, and that they can cure in the fields for 10 days or so. And then when they're stone ground, that they retain their nutritional value. And his theory is that the problem today with celiac and allergies to gluten comes from the heavy processing. It started with first the roller mills and how hot the wheat berries got. And today, the you know, highly processed flour for baking bread, lots of people are allergic to. When people first came to Cannes Falls, this is how they cleared their fields. And they could clear maybe two acres a day. We have a lot of neat farming records at the Historical Society. Perhaps one of our most prized possession is a collection of journals, some 40 years long, daily entries by John Malberg. And he was, uh, he was quite the farmer. Every day, it, it shows him, you know, went to Cannon Falls, sold 18 bushels, 20 pounds of wheat for this price. You can keep track of the, the price fluctuations through the late 19th century. We also have shipping records from 1880 to 1916 from the railroad, which show the different prices that people paid for their agricultural products coming in and out of the mills. 
I think that uh, a lot of you farmers and, and people in the audience are, are more familiar with the, the farming process and the, the threshing crew than I am. But I just, I think about the, the amount of work that it, it really took. I, I have a dog and I think that's a lot of work. I can't imagine 18 horses and the amount of hay and oats and food just for the horses alone and building, building the wagons. And the machinery, over $1,000 at that time, the wealth it took to purchase this machine, hooked up by a pulley to the threshing machine. This is kind of a neat era in farming, transition from all manual labor to tractors and manual labor to today, a, a combine can really do a, a lot of the work. But we're just really happy to be able to share our history with local residents, with young people, with tourists, with bicyclists in such a public place. And we thank the city of Cannon Falls for supporting us, Southeastern Minnesota Arts Council for granting us uh, arts and cultural heritage funds, the Historical Society Board for their tireless efforts in getting this done and their vision. John Althoff for agreeing to put it on his wall. The artist Steve Deleich, whose murals are all throughout southeastern Minnesota, sharing public art, and in this case, sharing history. We hope you enjoy the murals and enjoy the capstone event. We're serving ice cream and, and pie, and that's kind of... Uh, a throwback to another piece of our collection, an old-fashioned ice cream social napkin we have from the 1880s. I saw a hand go up. The high school kids are amazing. Mr. Delight had a group of how many? Seven? Eight? Five students and uh, Mrs. Hernke, the teacher, and Dennis Kahlo, I mean, this has really been a, a really neat project to be involved in. It's been a collaboration of dozens, if not up to 100 people. Um, Steve Bauer, Chuck Drometer for bringing the tractor. Channel 12, Dick for filming. Uh, the list can go on and on. And super pleased that uh, so many people got to have their hand in this public art. And we feel that the community has a sense of ownership. <laughs> Uh, about a year and a half ago, Steve Dablo uh, contacted me down in Blue Earth where I was working. He had seen a mural that I did in uh, in Heartland, Minnesota, and so he was real enthusiastic about that. It was a historical mural as well, and from the historical society as the as the president, he uh, he was real interested in seeing that happen in Cannon Falls. So we uh, we collaborated over the next year and a half of setting this project up, deciding sites, talking to people. And, and organizing the process and the funding of this whole uh, operation. And so we did two murals. We've got the harvest mural here and the mill pond or the mill mural over on the Burkhoff wall. So I hope people will go see that. So as we got this arranged and a, a nice grant came through through the legacy funding from the uh, Southeastern Minnesota Arts Council, uh, we, we knew that we were gonna be able to accomplish these murals. And so we also talked to the uh, high school who lined up five really excellent uh, students to work with me on this project. So that's been a really uh, a great thrill having both the extra hands and, and the great spirit that they bring to the uh, whole effort. So they've been uh, very integral in the, in the painting and uh, finishing of this mural. I still have a little to go as you might see on it. There's some detailing and fine pieces and then with the extra help, we decided to put the two panels on the outside of this mural. And those are going to be 
not just the scene, but really the personalities, so the portraits of the actual people that are, were involved in the early part of our uh, history in these counties and these areas. So uh, that, that story will be told by their faces and by their gestures and their activities that, that, that fit in with this whole harvest scene. As far as the painting process, on this mural we actually projected onto uh, paper and then perforated those papers, the simple outlines, and then uh, brought the paints in from that. So we transferred that, that drawing on the paper onto the wall and then uh, began painting. That gave us our scale and put all the pieces in the place. So that worked out real well then to have the extra hands to uh, create that process. The end panels that I'm doing, I'll be doing with the, uh, I'm just freehanding those in myself because I'm not having the uh, high schoolers help with that. So I'll just be drawing those in uh, in a freestyle, starting from the historical photographs that came from the history uh, museum here in town. So that's kind of it. We use regular house paints. Uh, they're made for the sun, they're made for the weather. We have a wonderful surface that we put up for this that really fits the area here, the stucco. and. Uh, it creates some challenges in painting because it's not smooth, but it also creates a real interest to the, uh, the whole artwork. And so then it's just the, a matter of uh, figuring out how to create that dynamic that's gonna fit the size and the space so that you have an interesting and, and challenging piece of artwork to look at and something that will last and uh, engage people and turn an environment that was really kind of sterile and, and boring, a parking lot, into an environment that's really a much more friendly and welcoming and human. And so we hope that the murals also do that. The, uh, the last thing, I guess, is just to dedicate the murals, the Harvest Mural, and hand it over to the city. It is public art. It's for the public. You own it. I hope you all enjoy it. Thank you very much. and gentlemen, a very good afternoon. It's so nice to see so many of you here for the services this afternoon. <laughs> you know, I'm looking at all of this grain up here and it got me to thinking that the earliest pioneer of civilization was never the railroad, never the newspaper, never the missionary, but whiskey. However, during our short time together here, let us keep one thing in mind, that truth is our most valuable resource. So let us economize on it. Now I had someone ask me as I was walking up the, the street coming on over here, I said, Samuel, you know, we've read some of your stuff, that Mark, or that, that, that Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn and all those things. You know, have you ever told the truth? <laughs> I, it would have been easier of them to ask me, you know, uh, when my first lie was. Because <laughs> I, I remember that vividly. I was three days old and found that if a pin was sticking in me, and I advertised it in the usual fashion. I was lovingly coddled, cuddled, and given a ration in between meals. <laughs> I'm way too far away from you nice people. <laughs> Are we all right, sir? Maybe. So anyway, let's go back to what I was talking about here. My, my first lie. I was three days old, found if a pin was sticking in me, and I advertised that I was lovingly coddled, cuddled, and given a ration in between meals. Well, it was natural to want those things. So I 
advertised a pin when there wasn't one. <laughs> oh, you would have done it. Y'all would have done it. Even George Washington wasn't disposed to telling that lie. There wasn't a child born up until 1867 that ever told the truth in regard to that, even George. Then the pin, safety pin came in and foiled the game. <laughs> but is that reform worth anything? No. It's reformed by fire and tin and has no virtue in it. Well, my mother found that there was no pin sticking in me and came to the stark realization that another liar had been added to the world's supply. She also discovered that afternoon that all liars are actors and speech need not have any part of it. <laughs> How did I get out of my second lie? Well, it's shaded by time, but I think that I was turned around and put over someone's knee. <laughs> I think there was music playing or something. I don't quite recall. Now, if it was my mother that so corrected my behavior, I don't recall that. Now, my mother, we tormented that poor woman, but oh, what a wonderful life she provided for us. Out in front of our house ran an old dirt road, hot and dusty in the summertime, and a good place for snakes. Now, if they were rattlesnakes or puff at us, we'd kill them. But if they were black snakes or the fabled hoop breed, we'd run without shame. But if they were house or garden snakes, we'd collect them up and take them home and put them in my mother's sewing basket as a surprise. Well, in the evening by the fire light, she'd take that sewing basket up into her lap to do her darning. And those snakes had come withering out of there. <laughs> it just disordered her mind. I was always disappointed how she could never get used to private snakes. She wasn't partial to bats either which was always a disappointment to me. Now I think a bat is the one of the most beautiful of God's creatures. Soft and silky to the touch and grateful for caressing if offered in the right spirit. I know all about these beautiful creatures because of our cave which was located a couple of miles down from Hannibal. It was multitudinously filled with bats and I like to take them home as a surprise for my mother. Now, if it was a school day, ostensibly I'd been in school and didn't have any bats. So I'd come home and tell my mother, who was a loving, trusting woman, Mother, I got a surprise for you in my pocket. <laughs> well, she'd reach her hand in, and she'd always take it out herself. I never did have to tell her. I was always disappointed how she could never quite cotton bats with as many opportunities as we provided for her. Now, I don't think, I talked about our cave two miles down from Hannibal. I don't think my mother was ever in that cave in her life. But people would come up and down the river it, to explore it. It was a beautiful place. Oh, it was full of, of passages and twists and turns and stalagmites types and so all those things. Good place to get lost in, even for the bats. I got lost in there one time with a young lady from St. Louis. <laughs> Our last candle had just about burned down. And then we saw the lights from the search party. <laughs> Another wasted opportunity of youth is what that was. Engine Joe the half-breed got lost in there for the space of a week and would have near starved to death had the bats run out. But there was no chance of that. 
In the book Tom Sawyer, I starved Injun Joe half to death. That really didn't happen. That was for the sake of literature. <laughs> General Gaines, our town drunk before Jimmy Finn took on the mantle, got lost in there for the space of a month. And finally, he took his handkerchief and stuck it out a hole and it came out on a hilltop near Serviton, just down river, down from the mouth of the cave. Somebody saw it and dug it out, dug him out. Well, you know, I know I've known the general all my life and I don't have any problem with his story. I just never knew him to own a handkerchief. <laughs> now, had he stuck his nose out that hole, <laughs> They would have seen him sooner and dug him out quicker. Usually I like to smoke while I walk. But in deference to this young lady right here, who's kind of taking a shine to me, I think, <laughs> I'll refrain. But I would ask, dear, if you allow me to hang on to it. It's become such a part of me that if I was to have to set it down, it would throw me out of balance and I'd probably topple over, which would be entertaining for you, but embarrassing for me. Now, I just, just about didn't make it here myself. I came by train to Red Wing and then I came up from there, but I was on one of those slow trains that needs to stop every seven minutes and rest for three quarters of an hour. Early on in our travels, one of the passengers came up to the conductor and said as how he thought he should take the cow catcher off the front of the train and put it on the back. For at the rate we were going, we didn't need to worry about hitting any cows. But we did need to worry about them jumping up on back and taking a free ride. Early on in our travels, a man came on with a dog and that dog barked incessantly at nothing until he died. I've come to the conclusion that if the good Lord ever wanted to send me to heaven by train, I'd just as soon go the other way. Now that dog barked until he died. I didn't ask what kind of dog it was because it was obviously strange. It was a long dog with short legs. It looked like a parenthesis turned sideways. Built on the plan of a bench, really. Now, and I didn't ask how it come to be deformed because the owner was obviously quite proud of it. Said as how it had won many prizes at dog shows and so forth, and how he could walk that dog around any city in this country and people would stop and stare at it. Well, I had no doubt that that was the truth. I could trot that dog around any city in the world. And if I didn't charge nothing for it, People were going to stop and stare at it. I don't think it was a dog at all. Might have wanted to be a dog. But I don't think it was a dog at all. I may just stay over here all day. <laughs> now one of the reasons I was on the train I was off looking for a job. Didn't know what kind of job I wanted, really didn't want to work. But when I got to the hotel, along the way I had caught a terrible cold. And the lady behind the desk said that the sure cure for a common cold is a quart of whiskey straight. Well, I went and visited a friend of mine uptown. He saw that I was ailing with the cold. And he reinforced what the lady had said. He said, the sure cure for your cold, Samuel, was a quart of whiskey straight. But ladies and gentlemen, 
That's about a half gallon. I drank it. Woo! I'm here to tell you, I've been drunk before, but that was a doozy. I went to bed early that night. I had the most terrible dream. I dreamt that I was baptized. About two o'clock in the morning, I got up. I had a WC call. Some of you are old enough to know what a WC is. The young people are looking at me like, what in the world is he talking about? I got up, I had a WC call. So I went out in the hallway in my nightshirt without a candle and kind of felt my way along. And then I realized that there was no WC on my floor. So I felt my way along and I went up a flight of stairs and fumbled along until I found a WC. So then I headed out to go home. So I went out and fumbled along and went up a flight and down a hall and up another flight. And then I realized that I probably should have gone down instead of going up. And when I came to that conclusion, I realized that I was lost and the rest of my mind went. I mean, I had to do something. A fella just can't stand there in his nightshirt looking like an envelope in need of an address and not do something about it. Now you'd think the proper thing to do would be to go down and count your way back up, now wouldn't you? Well, I couldn't do that, you see. There was a ball going on. Downstairs, there was a whole ballroom full of young ladies. A bad place for me to be caught in, in my state of mind and dressed as I was. Well, shortly thereafter, I heard those young ladies going up to bed. So I went into the closest door I could find, praying that it would be the right one. And it was. I stood there in that quiet dark darkness, happy and content to spend the rest of my days there, happy as a martyr when the fire won't burn. Some of them knocked for admittance. I told them I wasn't receiving, Tuesday being my day. Finally, when the house was all dead and quiet, I went down and stairs and counted my way back up. When you're done saying your prayers, would you kindly tell me what you're doing in my room? Well, I wasn't in the right room after all. Ladies and gentlemen, I was born November 30th, 1835. I was a sickly child and my mother was afraid that I wouldn't survive. Some years later, I asked her if that was indeed the case. I said, Mother, were you, were you afraid that I would pass on? She said, no, Samuel, I was afraid you were gonna live. <laughs> but when I was born, she looked out the window and saw the tail of Halley's Comet in the distance that thought that to be a good omen. So I've decided that when Halley's Comet comes around again, I'll take my leave of this good world. For I'm sure that the good Lord, if he found fit to bring two freaks of nature in on the same day, that he'd like to send two freaks of nature out on the same day. Ladies and gentlemen, I've appreciated your attention. <laughs> now I've, I've done all that. You can join us, you know. I'm not shy. Now I've done all the talking here. 
Has anybody got a question to me about my family, about me, about my life? Do you use that key to get out of jail with? No, I, you know, I was in jail though once. I was in there for drunk and disorderly once. Shoot just one. My wife, Livy, was the love of my life. She read many of my works. She was my, my copy editor. I had, oh, I, I can tell one story about one of my daughters. Clara, the only daughter to outlive me. It's because she was the meanest one of the bunch. I was given an honorary degree at Oxford University. And they gave me the most beautiful gown and mortarboard. I loved it. I would wear it for special occasions. So when Clara decided she was going to get married, I wore it to her wedding. She was so embarrassed that right after the ceremony, they got on a steamer and went to Europe and didn't come back for many years. Livy and I had four children. Langdon was the first, a boy, and he died at the age of two. And then Susie, who was the apple of my eye. I know a parent isn't supposed to have a favorite, but Susie was my favorite by far. At the age of 13, she wrote an autobiography of me. Now, sometimes I would play to her because I knew she was writing it down. <laughs> but she wrote that without using any sandpaper to smooth out my rough edges. She died of meningitis. The unfortunate part about that is that we were on tour. I was lecturing as we were in Europe and we got news that she was ill and Livy did not make it back in time, and she, she had passed by then. One of the darkest days of my life is when we lost Susie. Jean, well, Clara, was, a, was born after Susie, and Clara was a wonderful girl, but she was too much like me. That was the problem. She had a, she had a mean streak, and she had a temper. And then there was Jean. Jean. Jean was the youngest, and she had epilepsy. We didn't know what that was called at the time, and we went to a number of specialists, and as we would travel around the world, we'd try a variety of different cures, you see. And she had been in some asylums, and in, in those days, it was people who had epilepsy or other uh, tuberculosis or things like that, they put them in what were called asylums or sanatoriums. Well, she was well enough to be released right before Christmas one year. And she came home. Christmas was always a wonderful time in the Clemens home. This was after Livy had passed away and after Susie had passed away and Clara was gone at the time. Still embarrassed about my gown and mortarboard. But Jean was getting everything ready for Christmas, you see. And she went up on Christmas Eve to take a bath and had a seizure and drowned in the tub. And she was found by Katie, our, our longtime housekeeper. That's the, my children. Clara, now Clara lived into the uh, 1960s, actually. I'm going to step out of character. Clara was a hoot. Clara... Mark Twain had a dark side. Um, Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer uh, are his best known works. But after, after Susie died, and then right before Livy, and she was the love of his life, passed away, he started questioning his religious side, he, the dark side, the life in general. 
and he wrote some things, Letters from the Earth and some other titles, that the family really didn't want published because they thought it would show badly on his reputation. And so Clara was really kind of the gatekeeper of his works after he passed away. And he died very quietly, uh, April uh, 1910 at uh, 622. Uh, and he just slipped away. But many of his works, as a matter of fact, Letters from the Earth wasn't published until 1968. Uh, and there are some other things that I find in the research that I do that pop up that hadn't been published or were, were kind of obscure because the family thought that it would show badly on his reputation. But Clara had a very tragic life. She was married a couple of times. Her husbands squandered all of her money. She did have a daughter who tried to get into the movies uh, in the 1950s, but unfortunately ended up committing suicide. So there isn't a living Twain um, heir, you know, from, from, from the family, from the family at this time. But he's a, he's a fascinating guy. He, he lived on both sides because Samuel Clemens was a businessman, was part of the, the golden age um, of entrepreneurs. He, he associated with Carnegie and Edison and all of the writers of his day, um, uh, Bram Stoker. I mean, he used to have these people over all the time when he was in the United States. He lived in Europe a lot because it was less expensive. He was a terrible businessman and ended up going bankrupt. To get out of bankruptcy, he went on a world lecturing tour and paid each and every one of his debts. Uh, his friends came and said, you know, we'll take up a collection, we'll pay it off, don't worry about it, you know, just be you. And, but he wouldn't, well, actually Livy wouldn't let him. You know, he would have, but Livy wouldn't let him. So he went out and did the world tour and, and uh, uh, paid off all of his, his debts. The, um, but he was able to live on the Carnegie, you know, new money business side and be very proper, very Victorian. This is the Victorian age. And then there was, then there was Mark Twain. And Mark Twain was the bad boy. I mean, he could do whatever he wanted to do and people would accept it. If he wanted to drink a little too much, he smoked 40 cigars a day, uh, if you can imagine. And, uh, uh, but he was the, it was an alter ego. It was uh, Samuel Clemens was the businessman. Mark Twain was the raconteur, if you will.